see how muscles actually respond to increased inflammation in the field. Is this just a correlation, or is this actually a reducible defect that's happening within individual lifetimes? And they saw that, yes, actually, when you add crafts upstream, you start seeing some pretty freaked out muscles, right? They increase their cell function, they increase their attachment strength. They don't want to get eaten. So the conclusion there was that muscles increase investment and defense when they detect crafts. So another example of reducible defense is through the cottonwood tree that are felled by beavers. Beavers go out, cut down trees to make their dams. And one of these trees is the cottonwood tree. But when beavers go out and cut down cottonwood trees, cottonwood trees sprout back. And when they re-sprout, they have more defensive compounds. So you can see from the graphs that control trees that were never cut and trees that were cut and re-sprouted on the right had a difference in cell important concentration, which is a chemical defense basically put on by the plant. So when you cut a plant down, at least in this case by a beaver, it's going to defend itself. It's going to put more chemicals in its plant material to try to say, hey, don't eat me. I don't like this. So that's sort of the end of the constitutive and inducible defense. And this lecture, we're going to go more into the trophic ecology and talk a lot about food webs and top-down versus bottom-up control of consumption. Okay, so what is that? What we're talking about here is predators and prey. And predator and prey populations undergo cycles. Ecologists want to try to understand what controls these cycles. So we know a lot about predators and their prey out in the natural world. We can go out into the rocky inner tidal and look at sea stars and mussels. We can go out into terrestrial habitats and look at wolves and elk. But what's actually controlling the amount of a predator and the amount of a prey? One idea is that these cycles are controlled from the bottom up, which basically means from the bottom of the food chain. So the amount of food is controlling prey abundance, and the amount of prey regulates predator abundance. Basically, the more nutrients or the more plant material you put into a system, a bottom-up impact would predict that you would see higher amounts of every single trophic level. So the amount of prey is actually regulating predator abundance. Let me know if I'm going too fast, too. I'm not used to this lecture. Top-down effects, on the other hand, are when you have the opposite thing going on. Basically, predators are controlling prey abundance. So in this case, if you're talking about wolves and elk, the amount of elk you see is purely going to be a function of how many wolves are in the system to eat elk. So if you think of a food chain as sort of having these bottom trophic levels and top trophic levels, bottom-up means really the food web is impacted by how much food is available at the bottom. Top-down means the amount of predation is regulating everything else. And in reality, these things are usually happening at the same time, but the reason we care and the reason we introduce this is that sometimes one factor is more important than the other, more dominant in a particular system. Is that enough time? Okay. So one of the most classic examples that has been looked at is that of the hare and the lynx. So the lynx is a big cat, the hare is a rabbit, and people have been studying these populations for, as you can see, about 50 years in this diagram, probably much longer, and they cycle. So the gray line is the hare population, and the blue line is the lynx population. And you can see that these things are oscillating back and forth, and it's a correlation. It looks like they're related to one another. But what you can't tell is, is it the amount of hare that are regulating how many lynx you can have, or is it the amount of lynx that are regulating how many hare you can have that? So this is really what ecologists care about getting at, and the only way you can do it is through experiments. So one of the experiments that was done to test the influence of top-down versus bottom-up control was to go out into this area where lynx and hare existed and have a few different types of treatment plots. The plot all the way on the left, there were three plots that were unmanipulated controls. Basically, everything was the same. Hare and lynx were both allowed to be in the habitat, no manipulation. Um, the next plot was, had an electrified fence around it that excluded the lynx but allowed free access by hares. So basically a fence was put around the plot so that lynx couldn't come in. 
but hairs could roam wherever they wanted. So this is really just taking care of that top-down control when moving it. Another plot, or another two plots, um, were supplied extra food for hares. So lynx were free to roam in this habitat, but um, more food was added for the hares, with the prediction that if bottom-up control was happening, the more food you add, the more hares you should see, the more lynx you should see. And then finally, the fourth plot was the synergistic plot, where you had an electrified fence where lynx were not allowed into the environment, and you also added food. So the prediction here is, if you take away all the predators and you add more food, Hair are going to be stoked, right? You're going to see their population go up like crazy. And this sort of an experiment is really the only way you can try to get at the, the relative dominance of top-down versus bottom-up factors. So what happened? As you can see, this graph is a little bit confusing to interpret. Um, pay attention to the blue bars. Those are the controls. And the y-axis is the ratio of hair density to controls. So it's a ratio, basically meaning um, we're comparing how many more hairs there were in the experimental plots compared to the control plots. So the difference in the green bars is that that hair population was being tracked through time. As you go to the right in the green bars, that's 11 years. The three different plots from the top, middle, and bottom are different treatments. So the very top plot is when you added food. This was purely a bottom-up treatment. And what you can see is that as time went on, the hair population density relative to the controls increased. And uh, sort of near the end, maybe, who knows, maybe around eight years, you see the, the highest relative density of hairs. So indeed, when you add food, it does affect the hair population. You do see bottom-up impact. The middle plot is the predator exclusion plot. And in this one, um, it's it's pretty similar to the food added, but if you look at the actual number on the y-axis, you can see that even though hairs increase when you um, exclude the predators, they don't increase as much as they do when you just add food. And then finally, that bottom graph is really the most sort of compelling evidence that when you add food and you exclude predators, you see the biggest impact on those hair populations. You see this explosive increase up to 15 times the density of hairs that were in control plots. So the take-home message here is that top-down and bottom-up factors um, are both really important, and they can work together to create synergies, um, but also that, as you can see, the, the treatment where you added food, it increased hair density a little bit more than when you excluded predators in this system, in this context. So both top-down and bottom-up control are regulating populations, but bottom-up seems to have a relatively larger influence. Question? Yeah? Why is there still a crash? Why is there still a population? Good question. Um, I'm, not, I'm not particularly sure for this example. My guess would be that you start to see density-dependent effects. So um, when you have a lot of food added and you have a huge density of hair, eventually you might get things like interest-specific competition, not enough space, things like that. Yeah, so that's a good observation. You can see in all of these, there's a crash near the end, right? There's some sort of max hair density that's reached, and then it goes down from there. Could also be disease transmission when you increase the population size to a really big size, and then disease transpires faster. All right, so we're going to move from uh, consumption interactions right now into one of the other species interactions. These are mutualistic interactions, so positive, positive. This is the situation where both organisms or both species that are interacting benefit. And this is not to be confused with cooperation or altruism. So um, mutualistic interactions are still selfish. Each organism interacting is trying to help itself, and the effect of the interaction on both species' fitness is a positive one. So it just so happens that they're both getting what they want out of the situation. It's the rare case where both organisms are attempting to profit and both are successful. Um, whereas altruism, by definition, is where you, you increase another's fitness at the cost to yourself. Mutualism is really when you increase your own fitness and the other interactor also increases their fitness because of the interaction. 
And sometimes mutualisms are not stable throughout time. They can be, but they may change to consumptive or competitive relationships through time. So this is something to keep in mind with all these interactions, is that in an ecological framework, things can change. Um, the environment can be very dynamic. So what once was a mutualism may turn into a parasitism or um, a competitive interaction. You guys need more time on there? Okay. Um, and have you done the greenhouse activity for ecology yet? Yeah, so you, you have it. Not ecology, but evolution. Yeah. It's just Some of you did it. Okay, so if you haven't done it yet, um, or if you have, you can just kind of think about this. One of the examples that I'm going to be going over is that of the acacia tree and the ant. And this is an example of mutualism that can kind of almost turn into a parasitism. So these things can change over time. So, like I said, there's mutualism between ants and acacia trees. And in general, this is a positive interaction um, because acacia trees provide a home, a shelter to ants, and they also sometimes provide food. And as you'll see in the greenhouse, if you haven't done it yet, they don't always provide food. So that, that sort of depends on the context you're looking at. But often the acacia will provide home and food, and ants, in turn, defend the acacia trees from bravery. So plants with ants demonstrate better survival and growth. And you can see from these two graphs on the left, that y-axis is the tree surviving for 10 months. Basically, this is a proxy for, for trees living longer when they have ants present, those blue bars. On the right, you can look at plant growth, um, and that's a huge effect, right? When you have ants, those acacia trees are growing. Um, they're growing much bigger than when you don't have so this is basically a win-win in nature. Another really cool mutualism is that between the cleaner shrimp and fish. And this is a really great example of um, a mutualism that you might think could turn into a consumptive interaction pretty easily, right? That shrimp is going inside of the fish's mouth. Um, why doesn't he get eaten? What do you guys think about this? Yeah, so that, that shrimp is cleaning off parasites, is actually helping out the fish, probably to, to a higher degree in fitness than that fish would get from just eating the shrimp. It might be better off for him to get all those parasites removed than it would be just to eat the shrimp. Um, the shrimp clearly is getting food out of the deal. So this is a pretty interesting visual of Everyone's favorite Nemo fish, uh, clownfish, or also known as anemone fish, are mutualists with their sea anemones. And um, the, the deal works um, in a way that the anemone fish are basically getting shelter and protection by that sea anemone. They're also getting any food that might accumulate on the anemone. And the anemone is getting defense. Again, so the clownfish are going to fight off anyone that's trying to come and, and eat the anemone. Um, the anemone is also benefiting from nutrients that are secreted from, from fish excretion. So there's all sorts of wacky dynamics going on here. Mutualism between pollinators and flowers is probably one of the most ubiquitous mutualisms that we see in the world. Um, this can be with mammals like the bat on the left or with insects like bees on the right. And these types of mutualisms are probably at the heart of why um, we've seen such fascinating co-evolution between flowering plants and insects. So you can go back into the historical record and, and fossil record and basically see that when these flowering plants exploded, so did their mutualists. All right, another species interaction that is a little bit wackier is called commensalism. Um, and this is uh, basically a positive zero effect. What that means is that one species is gaining in fitness from the interaction, and the other species is completely unaffected. So a cool, um, a cool example of this is that of the remora and large fish or whales. 
by a large fish. Um, and so it, it's a pretty good deal for the remora. The host is relatively unaffected, especially when you have something like a whale that's huge. Um, the, there are people that have said that there are drag effects of having that remora clinging to the whale. And if you, if you had enough remoras, there probably would be a negative effect. But in general, if you think of just having one tiny little hitchhiker fish on a huge whale, there's not really much of a fitness effect on that whale. Um, another example is that of the fat innkeeper worm in this deck. Raise your hand if you've ever seen a fat innkeeper worm. Awesome. Nice. So you can see them at the aquarium. They have a little example, but they also are in the sediment. Um, and what they do is dig these really cool burrows, and their body moves with what's called peristaltic action. So it's kind of like a wave going back and forth in its own body. And they create a safe, well-ventilated burrow. So it's, it's really oxygenated, it's safe, um, and all these other critters kind of benefit from the creation of the burrow. So the goby fish, the pea crab, the scale worm, these are all borders, um, and they don't really have any fitness impacts on the worm. So the worm is serving this function that helps out some other organisms, and it doesn't really, it doesn't have benefit or consequence from the presence of the borders. Okay, so, so far we've been talking about direct interaction. Um, consumption, commensalism, mutualism, competition. And there's also amensalism. Have you guys covered amensalism at all? That's a negative zero interaction, and that's one that's not talked about much in ecology because it's kind of a weird one, but if you think about um, the walk you took to come into this classroom, you probably stepped on an ant on your way here. Let me tell you, that's not good for that ant's fitness, but it didn't really affect you, right? So that's sort of what we mean by amensalism. But there are a lot of other interactions that are actually indirect and can be very vital for food webs. So an indirect interaction, what do we mean by that? That's when we have two species that do not directly interact, but they still exert influence on each other. So they're not eating one another, they're not directly competing, they're not necessarily directly being a mutualist, but somehow they're still affecting each other. How does this happen? Um, when we draw these types of interactions in a food chain, we represent them by dotted lines. So anytime you have an indirect interaction, you have a dotted line. Anytime you have a direct interaction, it's a solid line. And the consequence of the interaction by one or both of them um, is really because of a third species. So when you have indirect interaction, it's because one species is interacting with the third, and that third species is interacting with the other indirect interactor. So we have a diagram that makes more sense. Do you guys need more time? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Species A is eating B through a consumptive relationship. B is eating C 
levels of elk and of plants and even other indirect interactors and see kind of why do wolves matter? Why do we care? What's going to happen when you add them into the food web or take them away? So the Trophic Cascade in Yellowstone Park that has occurred was a result of wolves being extirpated. So if you look at the very top panel, you can see that that's the number of wolves. And the number of wolves was pretty stable until around 1926 when wolves were extirpated. During this time, you can see from 1920 all the way to about 1995, wolves were virtually non-existent. There were none. They were hunted. And in 1995, wolves were restored. They were reintroduced into the system. And you can see their population spiked up. If you look at the second panel, that's the number of elk. And when you have the wolf population, the elk were being maintained by predation. After wolves were extirpated, you don't see this huge increase in elk. And that's because elk were culled until 1968. Culled is just another word for killed. It's humans basically going out and controlling the population levels. So elk were culled until 1968. But then culling was suspended in 1968. And if you look at that point on the graph, you can see that after that, the elk population just shot up. It expanded. However, in 1995, we have the reintroduction of the wolves. And you can see the elk kind of go down and are maintained again by the wolf population. That bottom panel is the number of oxen recruited. So this is what we mean by an indirect interaction. The presence of the wolves is actually controlling the population of elk and allowing for the recruitment of plants. But when you take wolves out of the food web and you have culling suspended of elk, the elk go crazy. And you can see in that 1900 to 1999, there's virtually no recruitment at all of any of this oxen. So oxen grazing by elk increases in the absence of wolves. And no new oxen recruits basically are able to recruit until the wolves return. But it's not just these three organisms that are affected by this interaction. There's actually, in addition to the indirect interaction of wolves on the plants, there's other indirect interactions in the food web. So one of those is the interaction between willow, beaver, and songbird in the system. And you can see, all you guys are probably well aware that beavers use trees to build dams. So they go out, they cut down willow, they build dams and lodges. And when they do this, they increase the level of groundwater in the system. They create wetlands. So they're what we call ecosystem engineers because they basically physically transform the habitats in which they live. Songbirds use these wetlands for feeding and breeding territories. So songbirds and beavers have this indirect positive interaction. And elk are feeding on both oxen and willow. Beavers are using willow habitats to make their dams. So both passerines and beavers are indirectly benefiting from wolf presence. And there's an indirect cost from the elk presence because elk are feeding not only on oxen but also on willow. So you can see that if you remove the wolf, you increase the elk, you actually are going to increase predation not only on oxen but also on the willow, which will make all the beavers now that are trying to go out there and use willow to build their dams. When they build their dams, they're increasing the wetland habitat, which is increasing the ability for songbirds to breed and have feeding territories. So indirect interactions are not just vertical. Sometimes they can be lateral, and they can occur with all sorts of different species in any ecosystem. Another really cool example of indirect interaction occurs in pond ecosystems where you have fish feeding on dragonfly larvae. So fish, dragonflies, and insect pollinators in and around pond ecosystems all interact. And what you can see is that when you have fish, fish eat dragonfly larvae. Well, when dragonflies grow up, they eat insect pollinators like bees and moths and flies. So if you look at the panel on the left, the y-axis there is the number of adult dragonflies seen for five minutes. And you can compare when you have fish and when you don't have fish. You can see when you don't have fish, there's much larger dragonflies. So dragonfly larvae are able to grow up when you don't have fish eating them. 
At the same time, when you have fish, the panel on the right graph shows that you're able to support uh, pollinators like bees. And when you don't have fish, that these pollinators are actually predated on by dragonflies. So you can take it one step further and think about the effect on flowers. And you would never think that a fish in a pond is actually helping populations of flowers or flowering plants in an area that's completely terrestrial, but these things are all linked. So this is a super cool example of a direct interaction. One of my favorite examples, um, and this is a widely known, compelling example of indirect interaction, is that of sea star predation on mussels in the inner tidals. This work was done by uh, Robert Payne up in the Pacific Northwest. And what he saw was that when you have sea stars, these orange and red guys, in the inner tidal, they don't really look like they're crazy predators, right? They move pretty slow. You might have to put a time-lapse camera out there to see them eating everything. But what they're doing is they're eating one of the most competitively dominant invertebrates in the inner tidal system, and that's mussels. So when you take, uh, when you take sea stars out of the habitat, what do you think happens to the mussels? It goes crazy. Mussels outcompete everything, grow over everything. So they did that, and they saw that when you have what they're calling a keystone predator cousin, the number of species in the entire habitat stays pretty constant. But when you take that keystone predator away, all of a sudden the species diversity, the number of species just crashes, and all you see is mussels. And so this leads us to the concept of keystone species, which I'll define more clearly in a couple slides. Um, but this was a really important discovery for ecologists, that even though sea stars are just another interactor in this food web, they're actually controlling the population of an organism that's competitively dominant. And when you take them out, everything else changes. So here's another slide that kind of uh, brings that point home. You can see that sea stars, which are the orange guys in there, uh, are feeding on all sorts of mussels, and when you have sea stars present, you're able to maintain other invertebrates in the inner tidal. Things like barnacles, gooseneck barnacles, rockweeds, etc. And when you start to take out those sea stars, you're eventually going to end up in a panel on the right, which is completely mussels covering every single lower, middle, Raise your hand if you have already heard the story of the sea otter, urchin, and kelp. That's not everyone. That's surprising. Okay. So this is a work that was done mostly in part by one of our own professors, Jim Essies. He's teaching ecology right now. Um, and you guys are pretty lucky to hear this example. Every ecology class across the entire globe is probably hearing the same story. Um, but this work came out of UC Santa Cruz and Jim Essies. So this is cool to hear a homegrown example. Um, and it's about sea otters, urchins, and kelp forests. So sea otters are predators. They're really, really amazing predators. Um, I'm gonna go back before you guys go. And one of the reasons they're, they're such good predators is that they don't have blubber. Sea otters have fur to keep them warm. They're these marine mammals that are living their entire lives in really cold water. And because of that, they have to eat all the time. So to keep up their body heat, they have to be constantly eating. Um, they eat things in kelp forests, like sea urchins, as well as crabs, clams, all sorts of other marine invertebrates that you would find in a kelp forest ecosystem. Sea urchins, which is one of their favorite food, um, prey on the hold fats of kelp. So they're really rampant herbivores. They're able to kind of tear down the hold fats of kelp and pretty quickly um, tear down an entire kelp forest if you let them. So what Essie's and others went out to basically try to look at was whether or not having sea otters present changed the kelp forest community diversity. And what they saw was, yes, absolutely it did. So I'll orient you guys to this graph. The top panel is the otter number. The middle panel, the sort of middle two panels are sea urchin biomass and grazing intensity by sea urchins. And then that bottom panel is the kelp biomass or kelp density, sorry. Um, and they did this work on multiple islands in the Aleutian Islands. So 
um, you can see that the legend on the top panel is just showing different islands. And what they saw was when you have relatively high order abundance, you don't see much urchin biomass or grazing intensity. So you have otters basically controlling urchin populations. When that happens, you see very high healthy density of kelp. And because kelp is what's called a foundation species, meaning it forms the habitat of kelp forests, you don't, you don't see a kelp forest without kelp, right? It's one of the main players in the system. So when you have otters, you control urchin and you maintain kelp. But what started to happen was as, um, as sea otters went down, you see a little bit of a change in the story. And that was due to another really cool predator, which is the orca, killer whales. Okay, so what they've been seeing now is recent declines in otters, and they think that one of the reasons is because uh, orcas are actually switching to feed on sea otters. So, Orcas feed on, there's, there's a group of orcas that feed on marine mammals, and there's a group of orcas that feed on fish. And the group of orcas that feed on marine mammals have been seen eating otters, which, as my friend Nicole likes to say, is basically like switching from a candy bar to a tic tac. If you're switching from a sea lion to an otter, you're going from something that has a huge amount of fat content to something that is a furball, basically, that's having to eat all day to even keep its body weight up. Um, and you can think about how many otters one orca might be able to take out. It's quite a bit. So, so what's been happening is the story has gotten a little more complex as orcas have been prey switching. Um, we've seen sea otter abundance decline, and we've seen sea urchin biomass and grazing intensity increase dramatically in the system, which has led to a decrease in total health density. So this again is is a trophic cascade. This is what we mean by the addition or the removal of a top predator having a cascading effect on interactors in the food chain below them in trophic levels. And this is also, again, an example of indirect effects. Question. Question, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, in case of the problem, also the relative level of is not so high, so it's not like they start eliminating anything. Really good question. So the question was, does that create a problem because orca populations are whales, we can't really go out and start killing whales, what does that mean? Um, there's been a lot of controversy in the literature, and the, the people who publish the orca story are by no means saying we think orcas are bad um, at all. And they're not saying we think orcas should be killed. Uh, it's basically just a story to say, you know, orcas, probably because their food source, with one of which was a stellar sea lion, which has totally plummeted, probably because of fisheries decline, um, are now switching. And there's this huge impact on ecology. So it's a really good question. Um, I don't think anyone that is studying this stuff thinks that orcas are a problem. Um, it's just sort of all of these things that humans have done to change the food web have had cascading impacts. So it, it's an interesting question, and in fact, we saw the same kind of results um, when orcas were eliminated because of overhunting back in the 1900s. So orcas were almost hunted to extinction. It's why they're an endangered species. They were hunted for their coats, um, and the reason they've even increased to higher densities in the, in the 80s, uh, in the 70s and 80s, was because of the Endangered Species Act. So it's a really interesting question, and I think one of the kind of main concerns of ecologists is not so much what natural native predators are doing to food chains, but how humans have influenced them. Yeah. Um, so I think this is the last slide. I'm probably going to see you guys out super early. Um, but keystone species, this is, a, this is a really important concept. So a keystone species is a species with effects on communities that are disproportionate to their biomass. And that word disproportionate means a lot here. So kelp is not a keystone species in a kelp forest. Corals are not keystone species in a coral reef. They're numerically dominant. They're important, but they're not a keystone species because a keystone species has to be very small in comparison to the effect it has on its community. Um, and that effect is usually in diversity, the maintenance of diversity. 
So in other words, they're a small part of the ecosystem, but they play a major role in structuring the community. And because of that, um, because you can't have a huge number of top predators because of energetics, which I think you guys will probably cover in ecosystem ecology, this tends to be top level predators that we designate as keystone species. Um, this little cartoon of a keystone is what the word came from. This is a stone that is used to build stone arches, and it's sort of this tiny little stone that holds everything else together. So if you take the keystone out, the arch will fall. And, and that's the idea, that's the metaphor here, is that if you take an otter out of the kelp forest, you're probably gonna have a bigger effect on that kelp forest than if you just removed one individual kelp, or one individual urchin. If you take sea stars out of the inner tidal, you're gonna see a big impact on diversity. And if you add a bunch of orchids, you're gonna also see a huge impact. So these things are disproportionate to the effects they have. Um, yeah, that's it. So thank you guys for listening.